This is my second video in my AP Biology review series um, to review for the AP Bio exam. And this video is going to be about um, macromolecules. So let's get started. Macromolecules are all large and complex carbon compounds, and they're made up of monomers, which are small molecules that serve as building blocks. And they make up polymers. So polymers are several monomers put together. And this happens through dehydration synthesis. Monomers are linked together by the removal of a water molecule. And this will create polymers. So let's look at this picture. As you can see, we have two monomers that are going to be linked together when water is removed. Um, so this creates a polymer that is connected by a covalent bond. And the way I like to think about it is dehydration, right? Um, removing water, dehydrating the molecule. Sorry, the, the monomers. And then the opposite of that is hydrolysis. So monomers are being split apart by adding water. So as you can see in this picture, there are two monomers that are linked by a covalent bond. Water is added and the monomers are split apart. So these two processes are like the opposite of each other. And hydrolysis, you can think lysis, like cutting, right? So you're basically cutting um, a polymer apart by adding water, hydro. So the first group of macromolecules that I'm going to discuss in this video are carbohydrates. And the monomer is monosaccharides. And monosaccharides usually have formulas that are a multiple of CH2O. So examples are glucose, um, which has a formula of C6H12O6, and fructose that has the same formula. Um, these are isomers. They're actually structural isomers to be more specific. And a glycosidic linkage is the bond formed between monosaccharides during a dehydration synthesis reaction. And the polymer is polysaccharides. Um, so several monosaccharides will make a polysaccharide. And more specifically, if you have two monosaccharides joined together, you're going to make a disaccharide. Um, so let's look at an example of a dehydration synthesis reaction with carbohydrates. So we have glucose, which is a monosaccharide, and fructose, which is another monosaccharide. And for both pictures, um, there are more hydrogen um, atoms and carbon atoms that are not being drawn just to avoid um, clutter. So I'm going to just draw in a hydrogen atom over there. It is there, it just um, isn't, wasn't drawn before um, because it's going to be part of the reaction. So that hydrogen atom with the hydroxide group from fructose will be removed. So water, right? Water is going to be removed. And this will lead to the creation of sucrose which is the two monosaccharides joined together, and sucrose is a disaccharide. So now let's talk a little bit more about polysaccharides. Um, the functions of these polymers depends on the structure of its sugar monomers. So we have glycogen, which stores carbohydrates in animals, and it stores it in liver and skeletal muscle. We have chitin, which is... Um, a molecule that makes up the exoskeleton of arthropods, which is, that, which is why I have that picture of that insect over there. Starch stores carbohydrates in plants. And cellulose is a major part of cell walls. So there's a picture over there of a cell wall, and you can see um, the part that is cellulose. So as, as you can see, these are all polysaccharides, but they have very different um, functions. Not, I wouldn't say like very different because glycogen and starch, I guess you could um, 
compare because they both store carbohydrates and the other two are more um, structural polysaccharides, um, but they differ because of the way the monomers are put together and their structure. So for example, starch and cellulose are both made up of glucose monomers, but starch is made up of one type of glucose um, called alpha glucose and cellulose is made up of beta glucose, um, which differ in their structure. And that leads to different functions. So next we're gonna talk about lipids, which is another group of macromolecules. They are hydrophobic. Uh, lipids include fats, oils, waxes, and steroids. Triglycerol, which is a lipid, has a glycerol head and three fatty acid tails. So as you can see in the picture, there are these three um, extensions that are made up of carbon and hydrogen, these long chains, those are the fatty acid tails. And the fatty acid tails and glycerol head are held together by ester linkages. Saturated versus unsaturated fats. Saturated fats um, are solid at room temperature so the fatty acid is saturated with hydrogen atoms. There are a lot of hydrogen atoms. And most animal fats are saturated fats. An example is butter. So if you look at this picture of um, the fatty acid tail, you can see that there's a lot of hydrogen atoms. And this will differ. Unsaturated fats won't have as many hydrogen atoms. Unsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature. And this is all because of a double bond. A double bond causes a bend in the fatty acid, which leads to the molecules not being able to pack together um, tightly enough to form a solid. Most plant and fish fats are unsaturated, which is why we call them oils. And an example is olive oil. So if you look at the picture, you can see that the double bond between the two carbon atoms leads to a bend, and that bend stops um, several fatty acid tails from you know, coming close to one another um, enough to form a solid. So in order to be an unsaturated fat, there has to be at least one double bond between the two carbons. Phospholipids um, have two fatty acid tails attached to a glycerol head. The head is hydrophilic, which means it likes water. And this is because it is polar. And it has a charge um, phosphate group, which is why it's polar and likes water. The tails, however, are hydrophobic. Um, they are nonpolar. As you can see in the picture, one has a double bond, which is why it's bent and they form a bilayer. So the tails are facing each other, heads on opposite ends, as you can see in the picture. And this is a really important part of the cell membrane. The fact that the heads are hydrophilic and tails are hydrophobic is very important to the cell. And we'll talk about it in another video. Steroids have four ring structure, as you can see in the picture. An example is cholesterol which is in cell membranes. Um, many steroids are produced from it. It's very important in the body, but too much of it will cause health problems, such as clogging of arteries. Uh, saturated and trans fats affect cholesterol levels, which is why they can be bad for health. And then here is the third group of macromolecules, proteins. Proteins are made up of amino acids, and amino acids are the monomers of polypeptides that are linked together in peptide bonds. So again, for all of these macromolecules, the monomers are being linked together through dehydration synthesis and separated through hydrolysis. So that applies to carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and then the last group we'll talk about later, nucleic acids. There are 20 amino acids. And a protein is one or more polypeptides folded together. So just to um, 
summarize, amino acids are monomers that make up polypeptides, and a protein will be one or more polypeptide. So this is an amino acid. On this side here, we have an amino group, NH2, a hydrogen atom, and then a carboxyl group. And the R is the side group. The box regions will always remain the same. So the amino group, the hydrogen atom, and the carboxyl group are the same on every single of the 20 amino acids. The only part that differs is going to be the side group, that R. There are 20 different side groups. So every amino acid will have the rest of the amino acid be the same, but the side group will be different. There are polar side groups, nonpolar side groups, and charged side groups. And this will be really important as we'll see in the next slide. So protein structure. Um, it's very important to note that the unique conformation of each protein will determine its function. So conformation is very important to its function. There are four levels of protein structure, primary structure, is the number and sequence of amino acids. There's a little chain of amino acids. Secondary structure held together by hydrogen bonds between polar side groups. So there's alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. And both of them are very strong. Um, for example, beta pleated sheets make up a protein in spider silk. Spider silk is very strong. There's an alpha helix. There's a beta beta sheet. There's a spider web. So as you can um, already see, the primary structure, so the number and sequence of amino acids, is really important in determining the secondary structure because it'll change where the hydrogen bonds between the polar side groups are. So keep that in mind. Primary structure is very important. Next, let's go to tertiary structure, which is basically how the polypeptide chain will fold. And at this point, it's called a globular protein. It's a three-dimensional um, round. And the bond, there are many different types of bonds that will determine the way that it folds, including hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, disulfide bridges, which are um, formed between amino acids with sulfur, sulfhydryl um, groups, hydrophobic interactions. So amino acids with nonpolar side groups will go toward the inside of the protein because they want to avoid contact with water. And at this point, the protein is functional. So here's a picture. Um, as you can see, the, there's hydrogen um, bonds that will um, form between polar side groups. There's disulfide bridges that will form between um, amino acids with sulfur. The um, side groups that are nonpolar are going to clump together and stay inside. Um, the opposite, there's also going to be hydrophilic interactions groups that like water will be on the outside, and ionic bonds. Then quaternary structure um, is basically optional. Not all proteins have quaternary structure. Um, and this is mul multiple polypeptides together. So some proteins won't have multiple polypeptides. They'll just have one, so they won't have quaternary structure. Um, and this is just an overview. Primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, quaternary structure, each one influences the next. So again, amino acid sequence is very important. The primary structure will um, change the secondary structure and then hence the tertiary and quaternary structure, which will affect its function as well. Um, so that is a prosthetic group, which is a non-protein part of a protein. So in this case, it's a heme group. Um, it's not actually like made of protein, it's just in addition to a protein. Protein conformation, denaturation, um, is when there's changes in temperature, 
pH or other environmental conditions, the protein may unfold. And this is because the intramolecular forces holding the protein together may weaken due to the changes in the environment. So um, the protein can no longer function properly because its structure, again, is very important to the way that it functions. So as you can see in the picture, there's a folded up protein, but when heat is added, the protein will unfold and is doesn't work anymore. It's not able to do its function. A chaperonin um, is a protein molecule that help like it helps a protein fold properly. Um, it keeps the protein protected from the environment as it folds. So in this picture on the side, it's kind of hard to see, but basically it'll open up um, and the protein will go inside and the chaperonin will close and the protein will fold. And then when it's done, it'll open and the protein can go and do its job. So the last group of macromolecules I'm going to talk about are nucleic acids, the monomer nucleotide. Um, many nucleotides bonded together form a polynucleotide. Um, and each nucleotide is made up of sugar, nitrogen base, a phosphate group. So here I'm going to draw a little nucleotide. Okay, so as you can see, um, there's a phosphate group attached to a sugar, and it's a pento sugar because it has five carbons, and a nitrogen base. And there's a reason that I've labeled the, um, the carbons because that will affect um, the way nucleotides bond together um, to form a polynucleotide. And we'll talk about this more in the next slide, but um, basically the five prime end will bond to the phosphate group. So the nitrogen base um, will differ uh, between nucleotides, there are pyrimidines, which are single ring um, nitrogen bases, and these include cytosine, thymine, uracil, and uracil is only found in RNA. Purines are double ringed, and they include adenine and thymine. So DNA is deoxyribose nucleic acid, and you can see it in the picture there at the top. Um, it's a double helix. The sugar in it is um, deoxyribose. The nitrogen bases are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. RNA is different, and you can also see it at the, um, in the picture there in the top corner. Um, it's ribonucleic acid. It is single-stranded. The sugar is ribose. And the nitrogen bases are adenine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine. So there's no thymine, but there's uracil instead. So a little bit more about nucleic acids in DNA. Um, thymine will bond with adenine. Cytosine will bond with guanine. And the 5 prime N end will bond with the 3 prime end, as you can see in the picture. So um, on the left side at the top where we have adenine, um, that um, nucleotide will bond with the three prime end um, on the other side. So the five prime end is the one where the phosphate group is first, is at the top, and the three prime end is where the phosphate group is at the bottom. So this is why um, a lot of times people say they're anti-parallel, right? So they're parallel, but kind of flipped. The 5 prime end will be with the 3 prime end, and if you look at the bottom of that picture where you see guanine and cytosine, it's the same thing. The, thir the 3 prime end of the left um, strand will match up with the 5 prime end of the other one, so 3 and 5 will always match up. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, and please subscribe if you would like to see more.